Hi guys, thanks for joining me for another Q&A video session on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian, and as usual with these Q&A videos, what I'm doing is going through a list I have here of some particularly good questions from some of the folks who have been kind enough to help support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. Go through and uh, answer your questions on a variety of gun subjects. So, let's get right to it. The first question I have is from Liam who asks, is there an inherent problem with magazine cutoffs on bolt-action rifles, such as those found on the Craig Jorgensen or the LaBelle, or did they stop using them for cost reasons? The answer is, I think, partly cost, but more significantly doctrinal issues. So, a little background for folks who aren't familiar with them. The idea of a magazine cutoff was with these newfangled magazine rifles that could actually hold more than one cartridge at a time, what countries would often do on the, the early examples of these guns is they would have a system where you could load the magazine and then flick a switch that would prevent the bolt from actually picking up rounds from the magazine. So instead, you'd have a loaded magazine in the gun and then you'd have to manually single load cartridges to shoot. And the, the classic idea is that this is, uh, this is there so that while you're just shooting calmly, you can load one, fire one, load one, fire one, etc. And then when you know, the, the Zulus come over the hill that you didn't expect, all of a sudden an emergency breaks out and you have access to the magazine and you can flip the magazine cut off and, and have a full magazine of ammunition at your disposal. Um, and that's pretty much accurate, but it leaves out an element of this, which is based on how troops actually were, were drilled for unit firing at the time. So the way troops were drilled to actually use magazine rifles is the same, it's a holdover from the way they were drilled to use single shot rifles. The British Army is a particularly good example. You can see, actually you can see this being done, for example, in the movie Zulu. What they would do is have a, one or multiple ranks of soldiers and they would, be, they would fire on command. So the sergeant or other commanding officer, depending on what army you were in, would give you the order to, to load the rifle, to aim the rifle, and fire the rifle, and then to reload the rifle. And the idea was, instead of having individual shooters picking targets, you'd have a whole line firing volleys all simultaneously. And this would have a much more significant moral effect on the enemy. Um, for example, using the Zulu as an example here, if you had a charging group of Zulu, and instead of trying to shoot people one at a time, the British would fire an entire volley. And from the charging Zulu's perspective, you'd have a really loud noise and a whole bunch of guys would just go down simultaneously. Um, this also allowed the, troop, the, the British troops, and pr this may be a more significant factor, uh, or the colonial troops in general, it would allow the, the officers to control ammunition usage. So, again, using the Zulu as an example, in many of the, the Zulu war battles, the British troops would march out of their encampment to engage an enemy, and they would have a specific number of cartridges on hand. It was typically something around 100 rounds per man. Well, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by hostile natives, and you run out of ammunition, you're in really bad shape. And it's much easier to actually control that ammunition supply if you have a sergeant or other officer keeping track of it and saying, all right, this target over there that we can see is worth three volleys of fire. So everyone's going to fire three cartridges. Now, Everybody's got 97 rounds left, that sort of thing. So when they had magazine rifles come into service, and by the way, the French did the same thing. Um, people often wonder why uh, a lot of the early French rifles, the Labelles and the Berthiers, and even the Moss 36 as a holdover, why they don't have safeties on them. Well, the answer is because you didn't carry that rifle with a round chamber. It was carried chamber empty, and you would fire on command in volleys, as, as dictated by your officer. So when you were ready to fire, you'd load around, fire it, and then either reload or just eject the shell, and there was no need to have a manual safety to keep the gun safe with a round chamber, because this was the doctrine of the military unit. Anyway, when magazine rifles came into being, the same doctrine applied, and the idea was you're firing on, in volleys on command, single loading. And that's why it's not really that big a deal. It's, you're basically doing the same thing as before, except now you have this reserve magazine at hand if you should need it. So if the line breaks up or if the enemy gets close enough that the officer decides to unleash individual fire, you can say, all right, use your magazines, fire it at targets of opportunity, go. And then you can really make use of the individual firepower of those magazine rifles. So 
once that doctrine ended, uh, once it was clear that it was not effective or worthwhile to be trying to do mass volley fire in ranks, then there was no reason to have that magazine cut off anymore, and it was uh, gotten rid of. I tell you what, nobody wants to call me on the phone until I start recording a video. Anyway, uh, second question we have is from Paul, and Paul asks, what are some weapons that come from parts of the world not known for small arms design? Have you come across any weapons or designs from Africa or the Middle East, for example? The answer is not really. Um, I spent some time thinking about this one and really pretty much drew a blank. Um, the issue is that designing and manufacturing small arms indigenously is a complicated and expensive task. Um, and it's often cheaper for a country to simply go to an existing foreign arms producer and buy whatever they need. A classic example of that would be the Remington Company in the, the latter part of the 1800s. They were selling rolling blocks like they were going out of style. Everybody and their brother was buying rolling blocks for their army because they were a reliable rifle, they were a durable rifle, they were simple, easy to train troops with, and they were relatively inexpensive. So if you're a country like, say, Ecuador, for example, doesn't have a lot of industrial capacity, certainly not in 1890, well, do you really want to, is it worthwhile for you to invest the money to set up a, a significant arms manufacturing facility and find some local designers who have the background. Well, of course, if you don't have the industrial capacity, you probably don't have a lot of people just kind of hanging around who happen to be skilled, knowledgeable engineers. Is it worth trying to invest everything to develop your own firearms when you could just call up Remington and they'll be happy to ship you as many rifles as you want for a lot lower price than it would ultimately cost you to make a few thousand yourself? So where we do have indigenous designs from places that we don't normally think of, what often happened was a local, particularly talented engineer or designer would get some ideas, but they would ultimately usually travel and find employment in a typically modernized country. Um, a good example of that would be Manuel Mondragon, uh, who designed, well, the 1908 uh, Mondragon or Mondragon uh, rifle for the Mexican army. That's Kind of, it's this cool example of the, the first semi-auto really adopted in, in significant scale as a standard issue weapon was done by the Mexican army. Well, were they manufacturing those in Mexico? No, it was designed by a Mexican designer. He went and got employment at the SIG factory in Switzerland. He worked with a bunch of other very talented designers. Uh, Colonel Rubin, for example, had a, played a major role in developing the, the ammunition for the early Mondragon rifles. And Mondragon used his connections back in Mexico to market the rifle, to basically say, hey, you know, I'm proud to be Mexican. I would like our army to have this high-tech weaponry. I've got connections to the military and the government. And by being here in Switzerland, I have access to the industrial capacity necessary to manufacture these guns and to test them and improve them and bring them to the point of being usable. So I'll do that, and then I'll sell the guns back to the home country. Um, some other examples... There, there are some other similar examples where a country would maybe bring in a designer. Um, for example, the San Cristobal carbine uh, used in uh, Guatemala, I believe. Or, um, was it Guatemala, Nicaragua? I'll have to look that up. I'm drawing a blank here at the moment. Um, at any rate, they were actually manufactured locally. Uh, in and Now, this is, we're talking in the 1900s, there is industrial capacity around that they converted to manufacturing firearms, but the design itself actually came from a Hungarian-born designer uh, who had marketed his talents around to design firearms for people who were interested in them. So what you don't normally see is an example of a, a not highly industrially developed country both coming up with a designer who has enough talent to come up with a good gun and also the manufacturing capacity to build those guns locally. You'll get one or the other, and that leads to, to some of what we look at and initially think are, are, are the guns that uh, we're asking about here, the, you know, the non-high-tech countries' guns. Um, another example would be Egypt. Egypt has the Hakim and the Rashid, um, and also the FN-49 for that matter. Um, but the, the Hakim and the Rashid specifically were built locally in Egypt, but they were done with a technical assistance contract from the Swedes, who had initially developed... Uh, the basic pattern of rifle in the Jungmann. Uh, the Swedes took their tooling, they happily sold it to Egypt, they helped Egypt get it set up and running, and then the Egyptians were able to build it. But it, 
it's not actually an, an Egyptian indigenous design. So that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I think that's pretty well covers uh, what we're looking at here. Actually, one other really good example would be the, the Chinese Liu rifle, which was a very early self-loader, and it was actually designed by a Chinese engineer who came up with the idea. Now, he had other examples that worked off of. None of this stuff is designed in a vacuum. Um, but he actually came to the U.S. and approached um, the Colt company. Had Colt actually make his tooling and his initial prototypes, which he was then going to take back to China to set up fabrication facilities there. Now, he died en route, and the, the project kind of fizzled away. But um, Maybe the, be the closest we would come to an example of what you're looking for here would actually, I would say, be Japan. Uh, it's kind of interesting that Japan was the epitome of the non-industrialized nation for quite some time uh, until some of the famous interactions with the, the opening of Japan to the West. And Japan actually industrialized pretty quickly and effectively and did their own indigenous, not necessarily design entirely. Uh, they had a lot of help from other countries, the Maratas. Uh, Single-shot Marauder rifles, they had assistance from the United States on, the Winchester Company specifically, uh, and then the Arasakas were in many ways a conglomerate of ideas from other rifles at the time. As I said, nobody was designing things entirely in a vacuum here, but the Japanese did a very good job of using local knowledge to combine the best aspects of what they could find in the world and turn that into a very effective rifle, the Type 38 Arasaka. All right, I think that's probably enough on that question. Why don't we move along to the next one? Uh, next one is from Simon. Uh, Simon has been very persistent with this question. He has asked it several times, and I apologize. I have not addressed it before now. However, Simon says, Simon says, um, I'm going to ask you, once again, to discuss the MG81 as an infantry light machine gun. Did anyone actually have one set up as an LMG? There are virtually no photos of them set up as such. Does the weapon have a quick change barrel? Given the high cyclic rate, this must have been an issue on the ground. Basically, anything on this weapon, pretty, pretty etc. Okay. Um, so, a little background. The MG-81 was designed as an aircraft machine gun. Uh, the 81 designation actually indicates that it is caliber 8mm, and it is the first iteration of that type of gun. So, 81. Uh, designed by the Mauser Company. Uh, developed initially from some ideas from the early 1930s. Um, a lot of people, especially at the time, kind of assumed that it was like the aircraft gun version of the MG-34, when in fact it had no parts interchangeability with the 34. It wasn't really... the 34 was, was produced and, and finalized by different people. Um, the idea of the 81 was we want an 8mm machine gun for aircraft armament. The specific requirement of an aircraft gun is to have a very high cyclic rate, because Two planes are flying around at a couple hundred miles an hour each, and you get brief opportunities where a stream of bullets can cross paths with an aircraft, and the more bullets you can put into that space at once, the greater your likelihood of hitting something and hitting something effectively. So um, this is characteristic of everybody's aircraft machine guns. They have very high rates of fire. The MG-81 in particular uh, is generally said to be 15, 1,600 rounds per minute. Um, in addition, they also had a version called the 81Z, where they had a paired set of 81s, one with a left-hand feed and one with a right-hand feed, and they set them up as a pair, and that gave you 3,000 rounds a minute, effectively, of bullet density. So, not bad. Now, by the end of World War II, uh, rifle caliber machine guns for aircraft use were becoming obsolete. Uh, an 8mm or a 30 caliber bullet just didn't have enough oomph to do a significant amount of, of damage to an aircraft. And what a lot of countries were doing was trying to bump this up to 50 caliber guns or 20 millimeter cannons. Uh, the Germans in particular did a lot of development of aircraft cannons. However, the MG-81 was produced in large numbers. It was used throughout World War II. And as with pretty much everything available, at the very end of the war, yes, they were set up as ground guns. Um, if you had the guns available and, you know, your last straggler is trying to defend Berlin, you'll use whatever you can get. Now, I have also not been able to find a picture of one actually used as a ground gun. Uh, I haven't done a ton of looking. I flipped through the couple of books I have, and none of them have an example photo from the period of that. Uh, however, there are some good reasons that 
it, while it would have been used in an emergency, it wouldn't have been a very good choice as a light machine gun. Um, the problem is twofold, and they're both based on the rate of fire of the guns. That rate of fire means, first of all, you're going to go through ammo very quickly, which means you have to have a significant supply of it. That's kind of one of those problems you're going to be having at the end of the war. As well as not having a lot of guns, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of ammo at your disposal. Um, certainly not stockpiles like you would have had when factories were in full production and there were great logistical setups and it was easy to transport and supply troops. So 1,600 rounds a minute, you're going to go through a, a can of 250 rounds in a very short time. Uh, doesn't give you a lot of opportunity to do suppressing fire, for example, with a high rate like that. Uh, now, at the same time, you're also developing the problem of cooling. So there are guns like someone, I know people are already saying it, well, the MG-34 or the MG-42 had an extremely high rate of fire. Not quite that high, but 1,000 rounds a minute or more. Same problem, right? Well, same ammo problem, didn't necessarily have the cooling problem because the MG-42 was set up with a quick-change barrel. And the doctrinal plan is when you're shooting an MG42, every time you run out of a 250 round belt, well, one guy's changing the belt out, another guy's swapping the barrel out. And you've got three barrels issued with the gun, and by cycling through a barrel with every belt, this allows you to keep all of the barrels cool enough to be easily usable, and you're not going to burn them out or damage the gun. The MG81 was designed for use in aircraft, where it's exposed to a slipstream at 10,000 feet or more altitude, and it's going several hundred miles an hour, and the designers basically don't have to do anything to allow for cooling on the gun except let it sit there in the aircraft fuselage and, and have this very fast, very cold wind blow over it. When you take that same gun and you put it in a static position on the ground, it's going to overheat very quickly. It's going to have a relatively light barrel, and there isn't anything built into the design to help it cool, because that was unnecessary for its intended use. So between those two things, a lack of available ammo and, and rate of fire and the cooling issues, the MG81 never would have gone into really heavy use as a light machine gun. It just wasn't a good option for it. Uh, now, what did happen uh, to a greater extent, I think, is that barrels for MG81s that were available in storage for the, from the Luftwaffe, uh, of course, you would eventually burn out the barrels just from volume of fire not necessarily heating. And so they'd need to have extra barrels so armorers could replace the barrels on, on the aircraft guns. Well, a lot of the barrels that were still in storage towards the end of the war got snapped up and used for last ditch rifle projects. So you'll find Volkssturm type rifles that are made with aircraft machine gun barrels. Because they're already made, they're chambered for eight millimeter Mauser, same cartridge. They can turn down and rethread as, as necessary and that's a lot cheaper than making new barrels. So I suspect the MG81's ground use at the end of the war was more significantly uh, towards <laughs> the use of its barrels in rifles than the use of actual MG-81 guns on ground mounts. All right, our next question is from Ryan. Ryan says, the unprecedented scale of violence in both world wars fueled international arms races and rapid developments in small arms technology. Outside of World Wars I and II, what conflict in history contributed most to the development of small arms technology? Uh, I don't know about necessarily contributed the most, but the one that comes to mind for me that contributed quite a lot is the United States Civil War. The U.S. Civil War was set up at this really kind of perfect historical intersection for small arms development. It was right at the, the crest, the, the very beginning of cartridge development, um, certainly in the U.S., but the people were developing metallic cartridges, uh, cases, primers, all of the components necessary for self-contained ammunition. And once you have self-contained ammunition, the opportunity for firearms development just explodes. So we had that. You also had an industrialized country with really quite a lot of entrepreneurial vigor. Uh, the US really was a land of opportunity. You could come here and if you had a good idea, there were tons of resources, there was tons of land. You could set up a shop and start building stuff. Uh, very easily, more easily than you could in Europe. Um, and couple those two things with the fact that when the U.S. goes to war, all of a sudden, both sides need firearms. You know, the U.S. Army was, was not something that was set up to go into a major war against itself in the 1860s. They had to massively recruit troops and arm them. Now, what the U.S. Ordnance Department did was to pretty much focus on 
the existing musket design just it, it it's a known good it's not the highest tech stuff but we know how to make it we're confident in it people know how to use it we'll make a gazillion of those however every firearms entrepreneur in the country and probably some outside the country looked at this as a fantastic opportunity for the gun that they had designed which they knew was fantastic and best and you know the hottest thing on the market and if you gave five of them to the union they would just crush the whole confederacy or vice versa for these guys it was a perfect opportunity to try and get military contracts which is easy money more or less in the firearms industry if you can get a military contract for a hundred thousand guns or ten thousand guns even or eight thousand guns being able to sell that many to a single client is far more efficient and, and effective and profitable than trying to sell a thousand individual guns to a thousand individuals on the commercial market. So with the US Civil War, you've got this combination of the technology is just developing, so the, the market is flooded with brand new ideas. No one's been able to do this before, to make cartridge guns in, in all sorts of new and different ways. So people are experimenting with new designs there's money available, or at least people think there's money available, and legitimately there was. Um, for example, the Union Cavalry invested in uh, at least a dozen, if not two dozen, different uh, carbine, new carbine designs. So there really legitimately was a financial opportunity to sell a bunch of guns to the military, and you're in the right place to be able to start a company and make a new product like that. So. There may be some other conflicts that had a significant uh, impact on arms development as well, but I would say the U.S. Civil War is one of the biggest ones uh, behind World Wars One and Two. Let's see. Our next question is from Carr K A R. It says, "Hi, I am interested in your opinion about revolvers and their place in the modern scene. Do revolvers offer anything that common semi-autos uh, don't, or are they mostly outdated now?" Thanks. In practical terms, for most uses, certainly military uses, police uses, yeah, the revolver's outdated. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't work anymore. They work just fine. For a lot of civilian purposes, revolvers are just as effective as they ever were. Um, they've been overtaken by semi-autos because semi-autos typically offer uh, better functionality in those areas where major buyers of handguns are looking. So, for example, they offer larger magazine capacity greater rate of fire, faster reloading, all that sort of thing. I would say the advantages that you can get from a revolver would be primarily, you can. it's easier to develop very heavy cartridges, very, very hot loads, very powerful cartridges for revolvers, because you don't have to try and build any sort of self-loading mechanism around them. Um, you don't have to worry about the locking lug shearing off because the slide on your 500 Auto Express gun aren't big enough. Now, of course, there are, like the Desert Eagle, the Auto Mags, there are self-loading handguns that have been made in very powerful handgun cartridges, but those are the exception. Um, they're the minority. In general, if you want a really hot, heavy cartridge in a handgun, a revolver is the better place to do it. It's just easier to, to design a non-self-loading mechanism for a cartridge like that. The other opportunity that, they ought, that you can get in a revolver is kind of comes from the same place. With a revolver, there is no problem in having a 357 Magnum cartridge followed by a 38 snake shot shell. They'll both fire just fine. In a semi-auto, it can be tricky to balance the mechanism such that it will work equally well with very powerful and very weak versions of a cartridge. So, now one might ask, what is the practical need to have a 357 and then a 38 snake shot load? There are some examples. There are people who carry revolvers specifically because their primary concern is, for example, a snake. So they keep a round of snake shot uh, in the, the first cylinder. But then they might also run into a mountain lion or some dude who's trying to steal their car out in the middle of nowhere. So they throw some 357s in the rest of the cylinder. And that's legit. You, people can argue about whether it's the best idea or not, but it makes sense. Uh, there are people who do it. It's not something the police are going to do. It's not something the military is going to do. It's not something that is going to really take market share away from self-loading pistols. So hopefully that addresses that question. Moving along, I don't know if you guys can hear that rain. I apologize for the background noise if you can. Um, 
Let's see, from Michael. Do I have a list of, do you have a, a gun or a list of guns that are among the worst ever, notorious for poor design, haphazard manufacture, danger to the user, or a combination of these? I guess you would call them best forgotten weapons. This brings up an interesting question. People often look at, for example, lists online. It's, it's popular and it's, it's easy, low-hanging fruit to make a list of like the 10 worst guns ever made. And what you end up with on those lists are guns that are perhaps misunderstood or legitimately not well designed for the circumstances in which they were actually used. The Shosho light machine gun's a good example. Not actually a horrible gun. Not the greatest, not horrible. But they took a, a gun with some flaws and they put it in a situation, World War One, where those flaws were particularly vulnerable on that gun. And as a result, it gets a horrible reputation. However, pretty much every gun on every list like that is actually a safe and effective gun if it's used in the proper context. So if you take a show show and you put it on a clean range, they run just fine if they are in reasonable condition to begin with, considering they're all 100 plus years old. Um, the idea that there are guns out there that will like explode and kill you randomly, it doesn't really happen because on the military side, no military is ever going to issue guns that are legitimately dangerous to their own soldiers. Um, I suppose there are exceptions with things like hand grenades, which are inherently dangerous because they're literally ticking time bombs. But when it comes to small arms, rifles, handguns, if the gun is dangerous to your own soldiers, it makes no sense to try and spend money making them and issuing them. Um, even the last ditch guns made by, for example, Japan and Germany during World War II, they look horrible, they look terrifying. As a general rule, they're actually totally safe. Um, they sacrificed everything they could on aesthetics, and finish, but where it really mattered, heat treating the bolt, making sure that the locking looks worked, that sort of stuff they never gave up on because the, it, there's no point in spending the money to make that rifle if you're gonna give it to a soldier and it's gonna explode on the first round and kill your own soldier. You'd be better off giving him nothing and having him try and capture some enemy weapon. So there aren't really guns out there that will do that. With the exception, perhaps, and this is an area where I am legitimately concerned enough about the safety that I have no experience firing these, and I probably won't ever. Uh, Chinese mystery pistols. Now, that's kind of the name I've started using for these things because I haven't been able to find a better overall name for this class of guns. But there were a wide variety of handguns made in the 1920s and 1930s in mainland China by very small shops working for warlords of various levels of power. Now. The powerful warlords had legitimate arms production factories that could make guns that were as good as anything you could buy most other places. But at the same time, there were also little tiny home shops, basically one guy, two guys, three guys with a blacksmith's forge and a bunch of files or a drill press making guns. And a lot of those guys, as far as I can tell from looking at the products they put out, they were basically given guns and said, here, make me more of these without actually understanding how the guns work or what was important to them. And in specific, one of the areas that, that is very concerning looking at those is they were typically chambered for either 32 ACP or 763 Mauser, or maybe 762 Tokarev, um, because those were two of the most common pistol cartridges in China at the time. And they're also virtually all simple blowback guns. They are not locked breech guns. And the idea of having a simple blowback 762 Tokarev firing pistol is concerning. Uh, that sort of thing can be done, but these Chinese pistols that are unmarked, they're not made by any reputable manufacturer, any known concern. The markings on them are often total gibberish. And they don't have bolts that are heavy enough or recoil springs that are strong enough to inspire any sort of confidence in shooting 762 Tokarev ammunition. Maybe they were. I don't know, maybe they weren't. Those are the sort of guns where I really suspect that at some random point in firing, something's gonna shear off and the slide's gonna just come flying off the back of the gun. And those I would in no way ever recommend shooting and I have a couple of them now myself and I don't plan on shooting them myself. Even the ones in 32 that would probably work, I don't know that there's any real need to, to put the gun or my own health on the line to fire those things. So. Those would be the one particular example I can come up with of 
firearms that really are best, maybe not best forgotten, because they're really cool to look at. They're interesting, especially the, the massive variety of designs. And it's kind of interesting to see what, if you hand a gun to someone who knows how to machine things at some level, but doesn't know how guns work, to see what they copy right and what they copy wrong. It, it, I find them very interesting to study, uh, but I would not recommend anyone shoot them, and I don't plan to shoot them myself. Right, next question is from Matthew, who says, I have read examples of the Martini Henry being converted to 303 caliber in the transition period before the First World War. Were they converted in significant numbers, and if so, were they fielded in any volume? Also, if an example could be acquired, would it be safe to shoot with modern factory ammunition? Um, I would say pretty much yes in all counts. Um, I don't know about made, you know, fielded in major numbers. Uh, they were issued, they were in inventory. They never, you know, you never really had a battalion of guys armed with 303 martinis, you know, charging at Passchendaele or anything like that. Um, however, the, the story behind this is basically the British Army had a whole lot of 45 caliber, or 450, 577 caliber martini Henry rifles and carbines. They adopted the brand new small bore high velocity 303 British cartridge, and as they began to make repeating rifles, Enfield rifles, uh, well, Lee action rifles, Lee Metfords, the Enfields, uh, it made sense since they were going to the 303 as their standard cartridge to convert existing martinis to the 303 as well so that you could keep those guns in service and you wouldn't have to immediately manufacture as many of the new guns. Uh, they did, in fact, convert a very substantial number, I believe it's over 100,000 uh, martinis, primarily carbines of both the cavalry and the artillery variety. They converted them to 303 uh, ammunition. I would say, so the problem here is some of the early 303 ammo was black powder. Um, I haven't looked into the 303 Enfield or the 303 martini conversions closely enough to be able to very confidently say that yes, all of them are safe to shoot with modern smokeless ammo. I expect some are. Um, some were made relatively late, converted relatively late. Uh, and probably the bigger factor here is that the individual condition of the rifle in question is going to have a very substantial impact. So if you've got one where the headspace is really loose and the locking block's kind of wobbly, yeah, I wouldn't shoot that. Uh, one in very good condition probably is safe. Um, but I would recommend wait, find, finding someone who has more specific knowledge on that subject and finding out from them before you actually shoot one. Don't go just on, on my advice here. I will say, however, I have been wanting to pick up at least one example of a 303 Martini for my own collection for a little while. I haven't found the right one yet. When I am able to, that is a subject that I will be looking into in a lot more depth because I would like to do a bunch of shooting with one if it is, in fact, safe. So, hopefully... In the future, I'll be able to do the research and have a, a much more substantive answer on the safety of that conversion. So, in the meantime, yes, there are a lot of them out there. Don't buy one that has come back from Afghanistan unless you are very familiar with what you're looking at because there are a ton of faked ones coming back from Afghanistan. They may be legit guns that have had their serial numbers and uh, dates fiddled with to make them legally importable or to make them look like they're legally importable. They may be guns that were completely made from scratch in various places in Pakistan and Afghanistan. If you're going to buy one that you suspect may be Afghan bringback, do your background research, know what it needs to look like, and make sure you're confident you're getting an original British gun. All right, we'll go with two more. I'm going rather long here, but uh, a couple more questions. Uh, the second to last one here is from Oliver, who says, What old commercial flop would you reintroduce into the market if you could, and would anyone but you buy it? And that is the question and the answer kind of at the same time. Um, I would, there are two guns that I would love to see reintroduced. I'd love to get my hands on and own a reproduction because the originals are very expensive and very hard to find. Those are, and I think I've mentioned this before, uh, the Burgess folding shotgun specifically. Um, the Burgess pump shotgun was a, an interesting design. It had the pump handle built into the wrist of the stock rather than under the barrel because Winchester already had a, a patent on the slide being under the barrel, so Burgess had to come up with a different way to do it. And because he didn't have any linkage going between the barrel and the action, since the pump was in the back, uh, 
he was able to make a really, really cool folding version of the shotgun that came apart right at the chamber, folded up. They actually sold it with a belt holster, and it really was one of the very first purpose-built combat shotguns. Short barrel, base almost a full-length tube, concealable, really neat. Now, the Burgess Company was only in business for a few years. Ultimately, they were bought up by Winchester, and when Winchester bought the company, they didn't want the, they, they bought it just to shut down the competition. So the guns went out of production, and the folding shotguns, which were never made in all that large quantity to begin with, are very expensive today. We're, you're talking 10000 10, plus dollars to get a good one. So I would love to see those make a comeback. Um, the other one is the Schwarzlosa model of 1898 automatic pistol, which is simply a gun ahead of its time. The ergonomics, the design, the cartridge are all much more modern than you would expect from an 1898 designed pistol. I got the chance to shoot one. It shot as well as I could have ever expected it to. I would love to have one today. I think it's still a practical and mechanically interesting pistol. The question that of course comes is would anyone buy them but me? And that's the problem and that's the reason why we don't see reproductions of, of historical guns with a few exceptions. <coughs> um, it's a question I get a lot on videos. I'll put up a video of some cool you know, one-off sort of thing, and inevitably there will be a couple of people who say, I'd love to buy a reproduction of that. The problem is, there aren't that many people who would want to buy a reproduction of that. Let's say it's the Japanese experimental Pedersen rifle, toggle action with a rotary magazine. Well, that gun is not going to be objectively better than anything currently on the market. The only reason someone would buy it is because of its historical interest, and you're going to lose a lot of the potential buyers because it's a reproduction and not actually an original one. So you've got a pretty limited pool of people who are actually interested in buying one beyond simply saying that it'd be cool to have one. People are actually willing to pony up money. That gets to a fairly small pool. And because of the economics of manufacturing, the smaller the number of things you're making, the more expensive each one of them is. There's a significant initial cost in doing the engineering and the tooling and the programming and working out kinks, that's something I don't think a lot of people necessarily recognize is just because, let's say I have a pristine example and I can reverse engineer it, well, that first example, first off, reverse engineering is not is more difficult set to, to do than to just say. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. And secondly, that original gun was made within a set of tolerances. And you don't, from one example, you have no idea what those tolerances are. You don't know if this particular measurement happens to be literally at the maximum of what it's allowable. And then if you take that measurement as your basis, and let's say you then add a tolerance plus or minus a couple thousandths of an inch, you may very well have half your parts not work because the original that you used wasn't in the exact middle of the tolerance zone, it was at the top. If you're re-engineering a gun like that, you always run into problems that have to be corrected. Uh, it's not just a matter of I take the exact measurements of this one and I make it exactly the same. Manufacturing doesn't work that way. You've got tolerances on everything, pluses and minuses. And the tighter those tolerances are, the more expensive it is to make the part because you're going to produce pieces that don't meet your very tight tolerances and you have to throw them away, but you also have to pay for them because you already paid for the work and the material to make them. So manufacturing isn't cheap. Manufacturing in small quantities is particularly not cheap. And what we see is kind of like the reproductions that are available on the market now. For example, uh, the FG-42 rifles uh, made by SMG guns, they're $5,000 a piece. They're good guns. They're great guns, actually. I love them. I can't wait to actually have my own permanently. I've shot a bunch of them. But uh, you, the problem is the, the intersection of the number of people willing to actually drop money and the cost to make the guns is a difficult problem to resolve. So you end up with a very nice reproduction, it's five grand. Let's say you want something that is closer to 100% accurate to the original. Well, you're looking at guns like, say, the PTR 44s, copy of the, uh, the Sturmgewehr. Those came in originally, they had some problems with parts at the beginning with the import. The guns ended up selling for $4,500 or $5,000. Today, they're selling for $7,500 or more, and that's with known issues of parts breaking in them. Um, People look at it and say, well, why can't someone make a reproduction that is cost-effective? Well, in fact, 
HMG, Hill and Mack Gunworks, kind of have with the Sturmgewehr. But the way they did it was to substantially change the small details of the gun. So they're, they still have the same taste and feel and, and I don't know the best way to put it. They, they feel like originals. Uh, they have the, the mechanical basics of the originals. But in the details, those guns have been changed to make them cost effective. In addition, HMG is planning to sell a lot of those guns. And they're not tooling up to make 50 of them. Because they're doing a lot more guns, now they're putting out a lot more initial outlay in money for tooling and production. Um, I think a lot of people would be a little bit shocked by how much money has to be put out just to make the first gun. Now, as long as you believe you have a price point and a product that can sell a lot, you can recoup that money and make a profit. But if HMG only sold 50 guns, they are going so flat bankrupt, it's not even funny. And with a lot of these reproductions of guns that aren't nearly as interesting on a wide scale as the Sturmgewehr, 50 may be all you can reasonably expect to sell, which means you then have to set your price at something where it's economical to make 50, like five or $10,000 per gun. So I think I got really long-winded there. Uh, ultimately, I don't think the Schwarzlosa is ever gonna be remanufactured. I, I don't think there are enough people interested. I do actually think the Bruges pump shotgun could be a sustainable product. In fact, I'm a little surprised that none of the Italian um, cowboy action-oriented companies have reproduced the Bruges to date. I think with the cowboy action shooting community, there is an, a fairly substantial ba customer base waiting that would be interested in that gun, in addition to people who think that they're just really cool guns. Um, it's also not quite as fantastically weird and expensive of a gun to make. Um, as some other uh, things that people want reproduced. So, Now, the inevitable follow-up question, which I'll touch on very briefly, is won't 3D printing change some of these things? The answer is it might. Um, it will not change any of the reverse engineering costs or challenges, uh, but it could conceivably make things more economical to manufacture in small numbers. How that actually plays out, we'll really just have to wait and see. Uh, it's not going to be done with plastic. The plastic is great for prototype modeling. Uh, we will have to wait for good 3D printing metal technology to come out before it will have any impact, any substantial impact on reproduction guns. So. All right, so we have time for one last question, which I'm probably going to go horribly into excruciating depth on as well, uh, which is from Robert. Robert says, do you think that John Browning's pistol design would have been as popular and mainstream throughout the 20th century if the model of 1911 had not won U.S. service pistol trials? For example, if something like the Luger had won, would we be seeing more toggle lock designs today? Or was Browning's design just destined to succeed with or without the 1911's success? I really think that Browning's design was destined to succeed. Um, I think history has kind of shown us that the, uh, the, the tilting breech design of Browning's... Now, it's interesting to note that Browning patented pretty much simultaneously not just the tilting breech uh, that became the 1911, but he also patented a rotating barrel pistol, a gas uh, lever action operated pistol, kind of like the 1895 machine gun, uh, and also uh, and also a straight blowback pistol, which became the 1903 pocket hammerless. He patented everything he could come up with. The one that took off for the U.S. military trials was the tilting breech, became the 1911. And I think we, by looking at the other pistols that have been made ever since, we can see that that mechanism by itself is really the best compromise of all factors for a military service pistol. So yeah, I think had the US adopted the Luger, other countries would have pushed development of that tilting breech system. Um, I, you see things like the Browning High Power. I think Browning would have continued to work on it himself. Uh, the High Power was initially designed for European military trials. I think it would have continued to have success there. and. Basically, Browning's design could have skipped straight over the actual military 1911 and uh, become just as popular as it is today. Now, the Luger as a specific gun, I don't think, had the US military adopted the Luger, there'd be a couple things. First off, we'd have a lot more uh, iteration and perfection. Well, you know, I don't even know that that's true because a lot of companies, a lot of countries adopted the Luger and it had plenty of opportunity to be refined and tweaked and improved. And ultimately, the problem with the Luger was that it was too expensive. It's just 
a really expensive pistol to make, and that's why people ended up ditching it. Um, it wasn't dropped for really for any particular mechanical problem. Um, there are potential issues with it. There are people who say it doesn't work well when it's dirty, it's got this problem or that problem, but from a military perspective, the real problem with the Luger was cost. So that's why the Germans went to the P-38, that's why the Swiss uh, went to the, the P-47. Everyone, by the time World War II is over, I don't think anyone would really be seriously looking at the Luger for major future use, including the U.S., even if the U.S. had adopted it. I think at that point, everyone would have been looking to the Browning system or something else that is more cost-effective to manufacture. So, now another interesting question to ponder is that of the 45 ACP cartridge, which only exists because the U.S. military decided to adopt it. It would have been in, what what would have been interesting, I think, is if the U.S. military had been convinced that the 45 ACP was not necessary, uh, which, by the way, is something that would have prompted uh, made it more likely for the Luger to be adopted. Um, the Luger was doing quite well in U.S. trials until the U.S. wanted a couple hundred of them for field trials at the same time that the Germans had just the German army had just adopted the Luger. And from DWM's perspective, they being the manufacturer, it wasn't cost effective to try and to tool up to make 200 of these completely different guns in a different cartridge when they were going to be making thousands upon thousands of 9mm guns. Had the US wanted a 9mm Luger, DWM would have been quite happy to continue competing in the trials. And that's something that conceivably might have led to the Luger actually being adopted by the US. Maybe not but it certainly would have had a better chance. Had that happened, I don't know that the 45 ACP cartridge ever would have become a thing. Uh, Colt manufactured and sold uh, the 1905 Colt in 45 ACP on the commercial market. It wasn't particularly successful. Um, I don't know that there's any reason the 45 would have taken off if it hadn't been for the US military. No. All right, I have not been watching uh, the, the clock perfectly well, but I'm pretty sure this has gotten excruciatingly long at this point. Thank you very much if you're still watching. Um, I appreciate it. If you would like to get one of your own questions in uh, in the queue for next month's Q&A video, that is a, an opportunity I give to all the people who are cool and uh, generous enough to help contribute to support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. You can check out my page at the Patreon link, which is in the description below. Uh, thank you guys very much. It is very much your contributions that make it possible for me to start doing a lot more traveling and bring you a lot of really cool stuff. So for a buck a month, I think your investment is well worth it. Obviously you guys do too, because you continue to subscribe and uh, help contribute. So thank you again. Tune in again next month for another Q&A. And of course we will have oodles of videos before then on other cool forgotten weapons.